Hi, I'm Seamless, and this is another how to bass tutorial, and today I'm going to show you how to make this sound. Yeah. This is a serum, and it's run through a bunch of some pretty regular stuff. We got some Maximuses and Vocodexes and all that, whatever. The key difference to, well, there's three things in here that are a bit different um, from kind of my regular businesses uh, in terms of what I don't want to do with Vocodex. Um, one of them is that I'm using Unison for once, and there's a reason for that. We'll talk about it. And this particular exact shape and, and uh, the band distribution here actually had some pretty important considerations. And we'll talk about that as well. And the other thing that's new, sort of, but also old, is that I'm using an actual modulator. I'm using a modulator that's not just the same sound. I'm modulating it with a recording of my vocalist, Tom. Uh, he is uh, in my metal band, God Eater. And this is what he sounds like. Well, sort of. This is what his voice sounds like modulated with Harmer. Like you can you can see in the waveform sort of why I wanted to use his voice to do this. While I was record, recording him, and again I use Edison to record so I could see it happening in real time. I thought to myself, he has pretty decent like format definition, and this is kind of what it sounds like if you were to do this with like white noise and some really sharp like bandpass filters. And in fact, there's a couple uh, love filter presets that do in fact do this, and they sound kind of like this if you get them low enough and in the right positions. Um, this has the benefit of having you know coming out of a human a human head, so it sounds a little bit more like a human voice, but it's not really what we're using it for. It also isn't exactly what it sounds like uh, naturally, because what's happening here is that I uh, turned the speed off so that like I am, mod I am modulating the position of the time manually. Um, I turned on the formant control mix, and what this allows us to do is to ch change the formant position a little bit like you would change the pitch of a band position inside Vocodex, inside the modulator pitch shift window. Um, a lot of times when I get to this window and I say things like move formants, people ask what the hell is a formant? And I'm honestly not sure I, you can go read the definition, but it's really not going to help in terms of like identifying a thing you want to do to a thing inside a sound. And so I tend not to ever like really give a definition for it because it just, it's, it's a big bit of a, it's a bit of a colloquial, colloquial, blah, 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 blah. it's right up there with people using the word transients just wrong 24 7 it's right out there with me using fm more or less incorrectly up there 24 7 but we're still going to keep doing it because otherwise no one will have any idea what we're talking about and in the case of this what it kind of does is it moves around the areas that it determines um is the most important to creating the form and shape so you can see there that it doesn't actually move any of the harmonics but it does move its the harmonics is like level it, it changes the level depending on what you're moving around of what it thinks is the thing that's causing the sound to sound the way it does <laughs> this is awesome ps when you're trying to do format uh modulation changes inside something because like when you're doing it in real life and you're using a post process like a time stretching algorithm which you, there's, there's a lot of um you're usually moving everything all at once, but with this, you could move particular particular sections of harmonics in up, up or down and get that result without like muddling up stuff that you didn't really want to move, which is a real big problem when you do this kind of processing on stuff outside of Harmer. Um, but that's the source that we're using for the modulator. Let's get back to this serum here. I muted the master. Good job, me. Um, yeah. Right, so back into the serum. Uh, using the cream, I squareized it, and it does sound pretty squarey when the AM's not in involved, but when the AM is involved, it's AMing with this shape. AM, we could basically think of this shape as being an LFO that we're applying to each individual oscillation of this waveform here. So we could really look at this as being like, for this one moment here at this shape that I created here, this area of the waveform will be audible, provided that the AM is at the exact center of the AM knob when you, when you engage the warp mode in the list. Um, right there is what gets us that exact thing I just described, where like down here is zero and up there is 100. Uh, down here is just it's just the middle of that. It's just, it's just or rather, it's the beginning of it. So down here is nothing at all happens. It's just the original sound, and then it f fades in, and then we get the, the chop all the way off. And then if you keep going, it's a bit of a mix, and I think it's just a reverse polarity, but I'm not totally sure. Point being, if you want to get this shape's exact sharpness, you want to be in the middle. So my automation of it is a skew a tiny bit, and I'm automating it with this guy over here. And you can see that it kind of stays, it doesn't really go above 50% much, 
I'm not even sure these are. And it's 51%, but I, I just kind of eyeballed it. Um, and when it's on, it's it, got, it gets us, you know, the tooth back. Oh, I just disabled it. The automation did just decide not to do it. What the hell? Oh, I turned it off. Ha, smart person. There it is. So then if we come back here, and you can see that that, that now has that squarey kind of tone because that... Uh, Without the a, a, uh, the AM going on in there, we don't we don't have saw the saw wave harmonics that are specific to the saw wave series. Um, that's why we have this automation on, so that like choice moments can be that kind of smooth, and then the rest of them can be the sharpness dependent on you know how you how sharp you, you want it, which is pretty good control to have. Um, and then it goes into a filter. It's just straight up a uh, low band high multi type, but instead of it being the the kind of multi type that gets you different. Like controls for for each different filter it's just a morph between the three of them and this is kind of interesting because if you look at my macro here the morph is one to one all the way up the whole thing but the filter is in the middle position here so this means that like when it goes when it gets to the bottom you can kind of see it happening like as it gets as it approaches near the end there like it gets to, sort of like to the lower frequencies but then like it opens up the low end so we don't have the end of the, of the bandpass holder blocking the sub frequencies same thing with that when it gets to the high end is that we don't have we don't have the bandpass blocking the higher frequencies um, when it gets up that high and because it's not like one-to-one -one, it's not it's not like it doesn't have an effect that would be like why don't i just use a bandpass filter this actually has uh, it, it solves some problems that bandpass filters create um by just being different filters at those positions which makes a lot of sense if you think about it um that sound gets put into effects i should have been doing in a patcher first up uh maximus uh just crushing it with the bands you can see like it's not subtle at all I'm not using a uh, master compression on this because it further processing will, will apply to it. And I've learned that it is kind of important not to screw with your uh, dynamics unless you like have to, um, especially at this stage in the early stages, because we're going to do, a, we're going to do that a lot to it. Like we're, we're screwing around with it in the multiband like clearly, but it adds up to still being a pretty dynamic signal with signal when you do that, um, at least in totality. Uh, so then when we do other things to it, like, distort it and whatnot like if it's already if it's already a capped signal then a lot of the like the things that those processes can do aren't going to be going to be present uh, not terribly but terribly important honestly uh this eq is interesting because it's an eq it's eqs but i have uh essentially the what was normally my like two notch thing but i'm doing it with uh peak filters so that they're not like killing it completely and i'm also automating the wet and dry of it on to match to modulation i'm not totally sure why i decided to do that but it does kind of change the character all oh, the slightly it does add a kind of like almost conversational complexity to it these two uh, animation clips are those two bands that I'm automating. And these two, uh, well, this guy is the mix level of that particular guy. And this guy is the mix level of the wave shaper, which comes next. I almost said Maximus. Um, and I just automated the mix inside the thing itself. It tends to be that on the top end of modulations for things that have like a main modulation is that the, that's the top end is where you have the most higher frequency stuff. And the lower end is when you have the most predominantly lower frequency stuff. And if you distort predominantly lower frequency stuff, you tend to get this kind of mud that I at least don't like. And a pretty easy way to deal with that is just to automate your mix so that you're not distorting you when you're that low. And you can take care of it that way. That's what I did here. Distortion itself is just, it's a really kind of minor. Like, it's not like the usual just big old saturation. And that's because the sound is very busy and very full. And that means that, like, you don't need to do a lot to it to get a, a, the kind of crunch you want out of it. Um, next EQ is just a pretty regular looking EQ. D big old dip at 500 hertz, the typical neuro way. This gets put into two places. It gets put into a whole other channel um, that gets that seriously just exists to be high passed. Um, in fact, why do I have this in the patcher? I'm gonna. It's not doing anything else. I probably had plans to do other things, but whatever. And this fruity balance. Oh, yeah, I'm automating that too. Did I link that to the filter? I did. It's good that I looked into that because I forgot about that. Um, anyway, this guy gets put into Vocodex alongside the carrier, modulator rather. But the carrier is the synth sound. It's the sound that gets changed, and then the modulator is the thing that changes the sound, if you were ever unclear about that. Um, it gets put into a Vocodex. Oh, I must have screwed up the routing button routing it. 
and routing it in again. Let's uh. That was right. All right, so it turns out uh, I actually, when I over here was demonstrating the filter and I turned the filter all the way up, I didn't turn it back. So then when it sounded like this, I was confused. It took me a while to come back and realize I did that. Whoops. Um, I also realized that uh, if I turned off this parametric EQ entirely, it actually sounds kind of cool during some positions. So I actually, I changed the automation of it so that instead of uh, doing this along with everything else the whole time, I actually turned it off during that moment to accent uh, something that the EQ actually covered up the first time, which was a bit serendipitous. Um, anyway, let's continue with what we were trying to talk about, which was what's going on inside the Vocodex. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, so that's not terribly audible. So before we talk about, I guess, the actual Vocodex, let's talk about what we're doing after the Vocodex. Um, this EQ, I actually did this uh, when I did the Maximus. And some problems occurred, and there was an interesting solution. So like wh with the Maximus and the EQ together, uh, this is what it sounds like. More or less the sound that we expected, plus a limiter, because I'm not using uh, mass limiting in the Maximus for a reason. We'll talk about it in a second. But what this EQ does, beyond EQing some stuff, is that there's two uh, points being modulated. This low pass filter and this peak here. This peak is really there just to mess around with the low mid kind of form and section so that like it kind of forces weight in places that might not have been there uh, naturally, which is to say like as a result of whatever I was doing ahead of time. Um, it's real subtle. But it does, at least to my ear, have an impact that matters. The thing that matters the most that's happening, though, is what's going on with number seven. It's basically there to force there to be rhythm. Because if it wasn't there... That's its value. The automation I'm using is this guy here. You can kind of see that like, while the rest of the automation tends to be a little sharper and deliberately sort of triangular, this guy's a bit more rounded. And the reason for that is because I really only want it to be engaged at the ends of phrases to sort of cap it to sort of tell you that it's like a note as opposed to being just a big old slur. And sometimes it's on, sometimes it's off. So here's, like a, here's an actual piece of automation that doesn't have it on the, during the main bit. And that gets us that, one, that fun little like slide into the next uh, moment there. Um, having having this sort of separate from the main automation, like because I could have macro all this together and that would have been easier, but like having this separate means that I could be that kind of nuanced. Um, this is the pitch bend, pitch bend, super great stuff. Uh, this is the Maximus mix level because you, you probably saw immediately after um, the filter that's doing this thing here, I have Maximus and I'm also automating the wet drive of the Maximus. Why the hell would I do that? Um, for actually exactly the same reasons that I would have done it to the the wave shaper earlier, and that like sometimes that massive ultra super compression going on in the middle here like is actually super cool sounding but like it almost it, it's almost never right sounding for the entire length of like zero to 100 of your modulation and it's for a lot of reasons and normally that modulation you want to you want to maintain um a little bit of dynamics anyway because like you want it to be noticeably on or off like with your modulation that's a big reason why putting that eq in here with the low pass filters to sort of preserve that so we can actually keep doing that and solve it the same way by just automating the and drive the ma a Maximus. So that like we can have that sort of light and darkness in time and not have to worry about how crushed it is because it's not actually that crushed all the time. Which is then why I have the master limiter after that because while I am crushing the low mid and high in the Maximus here, um, I wanted the output to actually be level and even, and even at this point being near, near the end of the sound. So I, need, I needed to have a master limiter on it, but I can't do that if I'm automating the wet dry like that. So that's why we have the limiter outside there. Outside there. Now, what we're hearing inside this is largely what's happening inside Vocodex. We're not done with it yet, like, because there's the one last thing that we do to kind of save all of it. But there is some interesting things happening in here that um, impact some things. So first off is I'm using Unison. I'm actually using Vocodex's Unison. I'm not 100% sure on if it's literally Unison or if it's some trickery about like what it does with bands and, and whatnot. But um, this is what it sounds like without it. <laughs> which is just like that's not even a usable sound at all and then here's this guy 
Of course, I'll, I had I, this. This setting was actually one of the earlier ones that I chose, which means that the rest of the ones that I have were tuned to this guy being here. So of course, it's going to sound ridiculous without it on because I didn't change any of the settings to make sense without it being on. Um, but it is like it was easier to get to this result with that on. And it, the reason is because like it does a good job of diffusing a lot of the crazier artifacts that show up as a result of using Vocodex at all. Um, I, I did the pretty usual stuff. Like I, I EQ'd out sort of like the low end and whenever I faded in the uh, carrier with its low end, you're going to high pass the whole thing anyway, when you're using it in a song. So it's not like it matters. Um, I don't have the compression on cause again, you know, dynamics, why not? Um, what else is happening? Uh, the bandwidth is all sorts of whatever different. Um, you might be wondering why the, the the visual of the of the bands isn't as loud as it usually is, and that's because we're not actually looking at the synth anymore. We're looking at the modulator. The bands always show the modulator, and I usually have the synth be its own modulator. In this case, that I am not, we are looking at the actual modulator, which is Tom's voice, which in comparison is not very loud. Um, modulator pitch shift also moved around. This is again like that format change kind of thing. Only this time, it's imparting it its difference onto the carrier versus just applying itself to the sound itself. And of course, the thing that matters is the band distribution window. This is almost, it looks a little bit like how it normally looks, doesn't it? Like it's got, it's very like, like normally you see, like this is what it looks like by default. And you see me do one of these. This would give us a linear progression of an even, even cut of bands all the way up, all the way up the spectrum, which is, this, which actually flies a bit in the face of the spectrum itself. Because if you look at the spectrum and you see 50 to 100 here down at the low end is 50 hertz. And then 5K to 10,000 is 5,000 hertz, but that same space is how long it is down there. And that's because there's more there's more harmonics, more frequencies up here than there are down here. So when we have a linear cut, it, with, with this particular cut, if we have a linear cut of um, of the bands of the vocal X, which I guess it means it's not linear if, it's gonna, if it shows up as visually as linear, but it's linear relative to this, which is to say that it's not going to actually fit with the frequencies at all, and that's why we get that phasey, uh, sort of ringy result. But if we do something like this, it actually makes it um, be more linear like that, more more like the spectrum, uh, where, where there was less uh, bands in the low end and more bands in the high end. And that's what this shape does. This shape does a little bit of both, but instead of it, instead of it sort of gradually changing, we have a tighter distribution, rather a thinner distribution down here, and then a denser distribution up here, but there's still two linear sets. And then doing it, doing it like this makes this guy curvy, which we really want this low end to be curvy because the low end suffers the most from that kind of um, linear shut up like that because the phases interact very closely with the harmonics because um, there's just not as many of them versus the high end, which can, tend, tend, can, tend, tend can to survive that kind of stuff. Yeesh. Um, and in this example here, this actually gets us some, some kind of squelchy result. And I actually saved the state for the other one because... I knew that messing with it would screw it up. Um, if you've ever seen me mess around with Harmer's use an index mapping window or have done so yourself, you might be familiar with what the shape does. Where if I have a linear shape from bottom top like this, we actually get some pretty straight, regular, like, squelchy business. And then if you do it like this, it gets sharper. And if you do it like this, it gets a bit different. It actually works out the same way. Let's say we wanted to describe that by using the word juicy. And we will say while we're doing this that you note that it is at its juiciest when it's sort of here. And that it does have a sort of juicier tail, but then it gets a little bit darker when it's like this. And then it gets almost just sort of regular sharpness when it gets to be like this. And it's not almost not juicy at all. And so like making the, the lines, separating the lines like this and choosing where this point is will help us to solve one of the biggest phasing problems that this creates. Um, and you can kind of hear it while I move it a little bit. Right there, you hear that ringing? That's a result of the interaction of the bands being forced into this position, this position, and then kind of meeting here, strangely. And that happens because where in the spectrum that we put this line to, to tell where it's going to happen, it happens to fall between bands or on a band or something like that interacts with the bands that creates that ringing sound and it's not permanent like it doesn't have to be that way but also doesn't you know, also don't have to lose whatever else you get out of this position that you actually like you saw when i move it around there that there's kind of it sort of filtered in between sort of different harmonics of it and like higher and lower and then even different kind of lower and then there's like a little mid spot where it didn't do that anymore 
I, I am mostly doing that by feel. I'm moving around until I feel it not doing that anymore. But what is happening is that it's it's essentially aligning its phase with these two sets of of uh, bands so that that ringing doesn't, like, it doesn't incorrectly interact, which in this case just means it does something that we don't like. And that's what you want to you want to focus on when you're moving these around, like really small motions that we're like, we're just trying to nudge the bands to be in just the right position to not create that sound. And this is one solution to this sound the way that it is because of how everything else is built. But like, it doesn't have to be just this. You could put more points in there and you can keep doing that. Like if so, if, like if you solve one sound, but there's some other sound left, you might want to put in another one to try and solve that sound separately. And you can. So like, this is one of the reasons I, I bring this up every time, you know, I mentioned Vocodex in the band distribution window. Like it's one of the reasons why Vocodex is the, the better vocoder out there because no other vocoder lets you just move a band around until it stops being a vocoder. Like it stops being the kind of problem that vocoders are are just expected to have. Anyway, the last step here is that I apply the dry sort of unvocoded signal, not the dry literal dry signal, but like it is being processed still, like this level of processing. Uh, I just layer that on top of everything else after the fact because the Vocodex, as good as it sounds, does a pretty good job of wrecking um, high frequency cohesion. Let's make sure this is right. It was not. Yeah, so like that kind of tin can phase feeling comes back, and I'm going to fix that by just layering a high pass layer of the dry signal. Yeah, you can kind of hear it. You know, it's just high passing it, and like when I when I normally do the whole um, it's its own modulator thing, with usually I can do this when I'm doing just with uh, Vocodex's own mixer up here. I could just fade in the modulator and, ha and high pass it. That's what this is. It's a high pass filter. But now, because I'm using a real voice as a modulator, that's what would show up, and that wouldn't really be helpful. So that's why I have to do this in a separate channel. It also helps that I can have a more, a more you know, nuanced EQ versus just it being on, off, but that's handy. I also have a fruity balance um, on this channel, because if I didn't, it would <laughs> kind of spill over a bit. Which, hey, they're really that bad sounding, but like I just wasn't in the mood for it to be that uh, not together. Um, but it's linked to the filters modulation, so like it's, it's kind of in line with this. So it's nice and synced up to that. And then these two signals, the vocoded one and the layered, go into a last maximus, which is really very basic. Like, it's just like really just like here's a limit, here's some time. And, like, they're not very fast. The middle, the middle one's a little bit faster than that, but like that's just because it's at the middle frequencies and I need those to be. Those are like the, the crux of the whole thing. The bass doesn't need to do much because it's just where it needs to be. And the high frequencies as well are crushed up enough that like they don't need to be that much more crushed. Oh, I guess the bass actually was kind of loud. I brought it down a bit. That seems to be what the case is. Pretty slowly though. I have a lot of delay in the low end here and a lot of delay in the master, which is keeping it smooth. Like this is a sound that really benefited from not being like crushed at the end because I wanted it to kind of be like it to save parts of it. I had this, this the soft saturation on, but it's not doing anything because it's not being allowed to leave zero dB. Rather, it's not being allowed past the ceiling, which for the moment is at zero dB. And then, yeah, that's the end of this. Um, cool. Uh, if you have any questions about this, um, please let me know. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and all that good stuff. Uh, there is this FLP in the description of this video if you want to download it. And also, I have a Discord server now. Um, that's also in the link of the description if you want to come hang out and chat with myself and unlike minded producers and that kind of thing uh go for it um it's new i don't really i don't have plans for it i don't have goals i just want to see what happens and all that stuff and of course do not forget to as always have a nice day man i kirked the hell out of that one